All right, we're just waiting for folks to join and we will get started. All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody, um, glad you can join us. My name is uh, Adil and I will be your mon moderator for the webinar this afternoon. Um, so I'd like to welcome everybody, all of our participants and thank you for your interest in the CMBS webinar series. Uh, a couple of announcements prior to starting. Um, you may wanna check our previous uh, webinar slides and recordings. That's all located on our YouTube channel. Um, we also, or the CMBS also encourages clinical engineering programs across the country to consider a CMBS peer review. We are in the process of updating our uh, standards of practice. Uh, and, and if, if you wanna, if you're interested, please do contact the CMBS secretari secretariat. Um, so today uh, we are, this is a continuation of our, of our webinar series that we have in lieu of a, an annual conference that we had to postpone, unfortunately, due to the, the pandemic but we will be reconvening in Vancouver, May 16th to 18th, 2023. So please make sure you mark those dates in your calendars. Uh, just a couple of t uh, logistical items for the webinar. Um, so once again, we will be accepting typed questions in the Q&A feature in Zoom. Um, uh, please do ask questions as the presentation is going on. Um, however, we will be answering, or the panelists will be answering questions at the end of the presentation only. So we're allotting about 15, 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Um, as always, the session will be recorded, the slides will be available, uh, and will be posted on our YouTube channel. And we may send out an online evaluation uh, that uh, that will be provided to, to the registrants uh, automatically, typically after the webinar ends, but maybe a little bit after. So please do uh, fill out that webinar uh the evaluation just so you know we we know we give you and the content that you that you'd want to see so today i am going to be presenting um, our expert presenter so we have jamie osborne from philips healthcare jamie is the global leader for philips enterprise monitoring as a service business growing from a venture she launched in 2016 to serving multiple hospitals and clinics during her 18 plus year tenure, she has held numerous leadership positions in marketing in strategy and business development in the Philips patient monitoring and clinical informatics business. Our topic today is related to patient monitoring. As patient monitoring systems become more and more complex, more reliant on software and IT ecosystems and more integrated uh, into hospital information systems, the importance of keeping systems up to date and compatible with related hospital infrastructure becomes ever more urgent. In recent years, organizations and individuals alike have dramatically increased their adoption of subscription-based services over the, owned of, over the owning of fixed aging assets. This concept as a surface and subscription offers are present in nearly all corners of the economy and now coming into healthcare as well. So in this presentation, Jamie, We'll be talking about and covering key concepts, uh, key service concepts, the pros and cons, and share examples of how a service offers are benefiting healthcare organizations clinically, operationally, and financially. Jamie, over to you. Thank you for joining us today. Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we're, we're really excited to uh, be here with you today, especially this community, because uh, specifically as it relates to patient monitoring and healthcare, uh, it's, it's definitely something that is very much top of mind, uh, especially with the biomedical community. And um, so we, we really welcome the opportunity to share, um, you know, a little bit of the journey and our findings and our learnings as we've been on this shift within Philips. Um, and so part of that starts with uh, kind of anchoring ourselves in what do we all on this call understand is what as a service means, right? So we'll, we'll do a little bit of baselining uh, that enables that transformation. Um, obviously, as a part of as a service, we typically see uh, a different business model with that, meaning a different way that you pay 
Um, but it's not fully just a different payment model, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that, where we've seen that in other industries. What, where did, you know, based on seeing that in other industries, what sparked the idea, right, for us within, uh, within Philips? Um, what other areas in Philips are we moving in this direction? Um, we will touch on at a high level the enterprise monitoring as a service, uh, as an example offer, and in effect, the, um, the benefits that we've already been seeing with our customers in them shifting to the model. We won't do a deep dive on it. We're not, we're not here to particularly, uh, you know, we're not here to sell you anything or anything, but just kind of, you know, share with you our journey, share with you um, the pros and the cons that we've seen um, as an industry is, is definitely making the shift. I spend a lot of time with um, hospital level executives uh, talking about this. I just was actually uh, spent a good chunk of time in Canada um, with various customers uh, talking about the shift in the Canadian market. We're also, uh, my role is global, so we just came back from Australia um, and, and really talking about how this benefits all key stakeholders um, from IT to CIOs to CNOs, uh, you know, CMOs, CEOs, CFOs, uh, but, but more particularly the, the, the clinicians and uh, the bio, biomedical teams on the ground that have to make things work. So that's kind of the objective. We'll talk about that. As mentioned, we will, we will leave time for q and I'm hoping to kind of get through the presentation in a, in a good 40 minute. Um, I personally can talk all day long about this, so I'm, <laughs> I'm putting myself to, uh, to time bounds here. Um, so, uh, but we want to make sure we have, we have good time for discussion. And, and also, I would love to hear your thoughts and concepts about even you know, barriers or ideas uh, specifically for the Canadian uh, market as well. So just to kind of anchor everyone in what we talk about with as a service, right? So I, I've used something that is very traditional to let's call it the IT space, which I'm sure many of you on this call, especially in light of your roles, right? You, you know the traditional as a service uh, as it relates to, for example, infrastructure as a service or platform as a service or software as a service. Um, and typically what you see, and, and I think this was a very good visual to depict where the translation starts to happen uh, within what you typically are responsible for managing and where another vendor or the vendor who's creating the offer starts to, the shift starts to change in ownership as well as responsibility. Um, it's kind of that evolution, right? Um, and, and I think what we recognize fully in patient monitoring and many areas in healthcare um, is that compared to other industries, uh, this kind of shift to as a service and subscription-based fee structures around the as a service um, has definitely, you know, taken a little bit more time uh, for various reasons, right? Um, there's lots of reasons behind that, um, but it's definitely picking up momentum. It's definitely picking up speed. This was not something as a uh, kind of a, a global leader, um, you know, as Philips is a global leader in patient monitoring, this is something that all the way back to 2015, customers started talking to us about. Um, and so with CIOs, with biomedical teams, with nursing and clinical teams, with CFOs, we really co-created uh, and developed, designed what we needed to solve the problems holistically. Um, but what we really talk about is, and I think this is where the pros and the cons come in a little bit, right, is that there's this tipping point at which you say the magnitude of what we have to manage now and all this blue on the screen of trying to manage this, and this is much more through the lens of technology, right, but all of this stuff we have to manage, we don't have enough budget, we don't have enough resources, it's rapidly changing. It's hard for us as an organization to try to manage that and even manage the future proofing or the life cycle changes and everything, which is why we've seen in other industries this tipping uh, to now say, well, you don't have to manage it all, right? And this is where the as a service models come in. Um, and, and we start to see that it's a shift in ownership, it's a shift in responsibility, but even when you look at what you traditionally may have managed in, a, let's say, a capital or transactional approach, um, the responsibility even for within your organization is still there. It just changes, right, in this, in this kind of as you move towards the orange, let's say. So just kind of wanted to anchor everyone when we talk about the solutions that we've been designing and developing within as a service. Um, they encompass infrastructure, they encompass platform, they encompass software. So it's kind of a combination of all of this stuff 
uh, related to the technology in the hospital system, which we kind of just coined it as X as a service, right? Um, but just to kind of give everyone the context of what we're talking about. And when you look at other companies, and it's it's kind of this concept of as a service and subscription economy is really all around us as 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 consumers, right? Um, whether it's our business world, whether it's our personal world, um, we we experience it, we consume it. Our companies buy, you know, the, the organizations that we work within buy uh, and manage things within this way, right? And it's really been a transition over time. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things we always talk about was like Rolls Royce, for example. I, out of every company on the screen, Rolls Royce is probably the oldest. Um, about 20 years ago, they started to shift towards an as a service model where they stopped buying uh, or stopped selling, let's say, airplane engines capitally and moved to a complete model of power by the hour, right? So paying for that that engine and every year that it's in the in the air or every hour that it's in the air. But that also allowed them to dynamically change their relationship and their engagement and their outcomes and deliverables um, with, uh, with analytics playing a much bigger play uh, into the efficiency gains, right? So part of what we're going to talk about is how you may change the business model, you may change the way you do the business and what's in there, but you're also changing and bringing room for a whole host of other areas that drive performance and improvements. And traditionally where we have seen in healthcare, right, is this kind of play so far has definitely been with lab systems, right? So there's a lot of lab systems that will do this kind of as a service model, right, or pay per slide or pay per other um, uh, approach to it. Uh, you don't buy the, you know, don't buy the equipment per se. Um, EMRs, electronic medical records, are typically in the space, Cerner, Epic, right? It's pretty much a SaaS kind of model. Um, and then across healthcare informatics, whether it's cardiology, radiology, PACs, et cetera, um, we've definitely seen that shift uh, already towards as a service, right? Um, so these aren't foreign. I think it's just a matter of now um, expanding, right, our thinking. Um, and what we've done is expanded our thinking in the space of uh, patient monitoring because we know the technology obsolescence, the future proofing, now that it's a part of a total ecosystem, an IT ecosystem in a hospital, and having to keep everything current and upgraded and integrated creates a whole and secure creates a whole host of challenges, which is also the impetus to really driving uh, the shift towards as a service. So what I want to ask you ask you to ask yourself as we're kind of going through this this these next couple slides is when you yourself in your role consider let's say innovation right because part of what um, you know it's it's to maintain it's to keep current it's to upgrade all these different things but but it's also about bringing innovation to a hospital right so that we can have the best clinical outcomes um, but when you look at that and upgrading the technology and improving the capabilities as you go along, like what what really for you is standing in the way of you getting done all the things that you uh, know need to be done and would like to see done? Um, and and there's a lot of you know barriers. Sometimes it's budget. Sometimes it's other factors. So just think about that as we go through this. And you know even when we get to the Q and A, we can talk about how. Uh, about how by you know shifting to this kind of model, some of those things become what are what what potentially is a barrier that that kind of roadblock gets removed. So when we kind of started talking to various healthcare organizations and co-creating with with hospitals, um, fundamentally what we heard was that the rate of innovation. So Phillips, you as a, a global healthcare player. You can keep bringing us new products. You can keep bringing us new technology. You can keep bringing that to us, but it it's outpacing our ability to actually keep up with it. And the limiting uh, the limiting factors to that are budget, resources, uh, adoption ability, uh, integration, all kinds of things. Right. So, what we heard was that there's a need to deliver more services with less hassle and more improvement in less time. Right, while addressing this ongoing issue of life cycle management, right, we've definitely seen in the patient monitoring world, is also in in uh, other areas of healthcare, because of the interconnectivity with electronic medical records, because of the data flowing between the systems, um, it also requires us. We get put uh, in regulatory standards now to have to also upgrade uh, 
uh, technology platforms or hardware more frequently than maybe what we did 10 years ago, right? Because it was kind of disconnected. So this, this, this pressure on this lifecycle management really starts to come into play. Then you got to match integration with that, right? Now in an ecosystem. Then on top of that, you've got to contend with the budget cycles to stay up with the lifecycle management, the reoccurring changes that need to happen. And then let alone, if we now look at the pandemic and the burden that that put in terms of having to rapidly cycle, having to rapidly cycle, you know, flex up, flex down, uh, you know, on demand capacity and capabilities that were needed that we've never had to really deal with before. And then the budgeting to have to manage that, right? Um, but then on top of that, on either sides, it's it's also like, okay, great, but what about the IT staffing and clinical capabilities, right? It's not just IT, but it's also the clinical capabilities. How do we keep, not training, but how do we keep developing those capabilities, right? How do we keep iterating and finding ways where, for example, the workflow or the efficiency is not working? We're not adhering to policy. But we're kind of flying blind and we have no idea where that is right now and how do we improve those capabilities right how do we really know whether things are being used or whether they're not being used um so there's that factor which also factors into the adoption rate right of the clinical innovation and so most you know cios uh biomedical communities that we talk to clinicians cnos will say we take right now we buy equipment we run it we use it but we're really flying blind in how efficiently we are using it and what is the cost of inefficiency? Where is it being adopted? Where is it not being adopted? Where are we adhering? Where are we creating risk? Um, and I think patient monitoring is a little bit unique in this sense because it truly is used 24 seven, right? In the hospital and it's pretty much touched by all clinicians, right? So there's there's this element and it's it's on every patient or you know depending on your acuity and, and the workflow. But, but that's 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 a dynamic medical device, let's say, that has has kind of ramifications and permutations that maybe we don't see in some other areas of the hospital related to equipment. So these were some of the things that we said, okay, we've whatever we go, whatever we do as Phillips, we need to really start by thinking about this way. We need to think about our technology in a very different way, right? This isn't about selling a product. This is about us really thinking about how our technology, how our innovation creates impact. And ultimately, we want to make sure that it's being used for the best practice, which is delivering an outcome. So when you start to talk about shifting to as a service models, right, then, and, and if you look at AWS, you look at Azure, you look at any of these very traditional, let's call them, you know, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service type of models, what you fundamentally see in the shift is that it's a from two. Right. And it, it comes with that trade off of do I really need to own this because I can own it, but what do I really have in, in 10, five years or seven years? Right. I got to go rebuy it all again. Did I really gain any capabilities? Did I really gain what I needed? Right. So there's this kind of like trade off that you start to go through when you start to look at the mass of the things that have to get done with limited budgets and limited people. And uh, and then again, put the pressure of a pandemic on all of that, and you really start to see where these things bubble to the top and are not manageable anymore. So the from two is you move away in these models to shift to buying purchasing equipment, right? So like in the case in the example with Rolls Royce, it's not about buying an airplane engine anymore, right? It's about subscribing to the capabilities for you to have the capability of an airplane engine on an airplane to put it up in the air and pay for it as it's in the air, right? So you subscribe to capabilities. What do you need, where you need it, when you need it? Now that subscription to capabilities also comes with flexibility, right? That you don't traditionally have when you just purchase equipment. So if you need to take, for example, uh, you know, so many beds and very quickly and very rapidly flex them, to be able to accommodate high acuity, right? So like an ICU, to create an ICU bed, for example, and have the functionality and the capabilities needed to deliver and care for a high, highly acute patient. When you look at this through the lens of purchasing equipment, there's a whole process that has to happen to even make something simple like that happen. But in reality, if we think about subscribing to capabilities versus buying equipment, it could actually just be done at the touch of a button with a, just a different fee structure, right? 
So there's different ways to kind of look at this as we go through this, right? So, you know, yes, we traditionally in a capital model would install it, you utilize it, we train. And we still do that in this model, but we call that just onboarding. That's what that's table stakes to get you up and running. What it's really about is ensuring that we drive adoption and adherence, right? Is the technology being used? Is the policies that you have in place being adhered to? Do we know where it's not being adhered to? Can we see it? And typically we can see it in the data because we literally see the clinical work through play out as patients are being monitored, right? And I'll get into a little bit more about that in terms of these data analytics. But this is where the data analytics, no different than what Rolls-Royce did with the airplane engines, right? Yeah, sure, we can put the airplane engines and say, okay, we charge you a power by the hour, but that's not what Rolls-Royce did. They built a whole analytics component to drive now uh, insights and data to use of those airplane engines and to give guidance to pilots in terms of fuel saving and speed of those engines and uh, functionality of those engines and maintenance of those engines, all proactive things. The other thing is around, okay, great. So I've got it, I'm utilizing it. Now what happens when it needs to be fixed, needs to be upgraded or it needs to be serviced, right? Which now becomes this big, huge cluster in light of the fact that all of this stuff has to inter interoperate, has to be secure uh, within a health healthcare system. It's all part of an IT ecosystem. So fixing it, upgrading it, and servicing it, right? Well, in these kinds of models, when you tie the vendor's ownership and responsibility to their payment, then like in a usage model, if it's not fixed and it's not upgraded and it's not serviced, we don't get paid. So you start to see why those responsibilities and those roles start to change, right? But it's really about driving system optimization. It's not just making sure that it's available. It's making sure that it's most optimized that it possibly can for your capacity and your capabilities. And lastly, it's really about driving business outcomes. It's not about refreshing. It's not about changing out the whole technology and platform stack. It's really about keeping it current, keeping it managed, and then continuing to drive business outcomes around that. So this is really the shift of the from two that as you start to explore and consume as a service models, and you've seen it with AWS, you've seen it with Azure, Azure, you've seen it with many of those other companies I had on the slide. This is the focus of what they're driving in part of shifting to an as a service. So when we talk about pros and cons, right? And, and I've spent a lot of time, as I mentioned, with, with biomeds, and we've talked a lot about this. There's sometimes an immediate reaction that, okay, well, if we shift to as a service, then I'm giving up my responsibility, right? I'm giving up what I do. I'm giving up my job. I'm giving up my ownership. And actually, it's not actually the case because an as a service model also can't function without that key role, right? We saw it in radiology, for example, right? When all of a sudden film went away and, you know, we had rad techs going, well, what do I do? I'm not here to develop film anymore. It's digital. Their role was still relevant. Did their role change? Did they become more administrators from a digital perspective? Absolutely. Right? Did they become more part of the IT infrastructure? Absolutely. So what we what we've definitely designed in in part of this is that when we look at traditionally the people on the ground every day who are in effect fighting and managing to keep this equipment utilized, updated to serve the clinicians, right, and the patients, because it's critical. So keeping up with the constant change in technology with the clinical adoption and the combination of that, it's, it's hard, it's difficult, it's a major pain. Um, looking at the increased security risk with the outdated systems becomes a major daily burden. The technical confidence in supporting and maintaining system integration, when you're doing all of that on your own, the disconnect between technical capabilities and clinical user requirements and having to somehow always try to marry these two things together. These are a lot of the things and, and then all of this with unplanned and unpredictable expenditure requests that might require trade-offs and reprioritization. So these are the things that typically we hear over and over again, especially from a community like yours. And the burden really is on you as an organization and as a, as a, as a function, critical function in the hospital, trying to manage a very dynamic changing hospital environment that all relies heavily on that technology to be able to deliver care to the patients, right? And there's pressure from clinicians, there's pressure from IT, 
And they keep asking for more. I need this. This doesn't work. How do we fix this? This is a risk. This, and literally it just keeps mounting, but the budgets don't actually keep up with the need, right? Then you're fighting a discussion about budgets, right? So you, you kind of feel deflated in a lot of cases in the end because it's like, I'm trying to do my best, but I don't feel like I'm making progress. I don't actually feel like we're getting to a level of standardization. I don't actually feel like we're 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 really driving outcomes or improvements, right? And and you know, there's there's maybe that one clinician that you kind of avoid in the hall because you're like, I don't have an answer for you. I can't I can't help you with what you need right now because there's no budget. So we know the challenges, and part of the shifting is not about taking away roles and responsibilities. It's really about ensuring that you have the backup. You have the business model. You don't have to worry about the budgeting anymore, right? So part of the shift is your focus and your roles is now the interaction with the clinicians, right? The one thing that customers said to us, especially in patient monitoring is, we have our biomedical team every single day who've built, built strong relationships with our clinicians. They want a person to call. They wanna be able to pick up the phone. They wanna be able to stop them in the hall. Phillips, it doesn't matter what you do, you will never be able to change that situation, right? So don't try to. Leverage the power and leverage the experience and the rich relationships that are already there. And so that's what we try to also do in all of our thinking with this model is the people on the ground who have the relationships every day are the first line support, can do the triage, can do the troubleshooting. But now you have a backup right, with this as a service model with us to provide you the technical and the clinical capabilities to get things fixed, to address issues where there's problems uh, with either the technology or the workflow or the data flow, um, and to make sure that it gets fixed. Because if it doesn't get fixed, we don't get paid. But also to do future planning, right, to do when upgrades need to happen. You know, you working with us to tell us, well, that unit based on its utilization is probably the best unit to start with the upgrade on, right? To upgrade the software because it's planned downtime in some cases, right? When you're running at a high occupancy, how do you decide which unit has to get upgraded first, right? And what that, what that timing is. These are all planning conversations that even in as a service model, the biomedical team and the IT team are critical um, at the table with us as a partner to make sure that this stuff can get done and the entitlements can be consumed. So from a Philips as a service, we, we kind of are breaking out it. Let, let's think about it in these four pillars, right? Which is ensuring capabilities, ensuring efficiency, ensuring predictability, but giving you confidence in the middle, right? To address those burdens. And so we kind of do that through, and depending on the offer, it's a little bit different, but standardized technology and advanced expertise, right? That's that's part of what your 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 entitlements are as a part of an as a, now moving to an as a service versus capital transactional buying equipment, right? But we also have shared dynamic planning and processes like I was just mentioning. And then there's also a transparent, for example, a pay per bed or a pay per patient subscription. So you get the infrastructure, you get the platform, you get the clinical services, you get the performance planning, you get the ongoing assurance of upgrades you get the flexibility of the capacity and the capability where and when you need it in a dynamic environment. And you're just paying for that through a simple price per bed or a price per patient, for example, as a subscription, right? And then a part of that builds the long-term engagement with a trusted partner because we're also bringing data to the table to help make informed decisions with you, right? So what I would say critically, and I've been doing this for a long time in terms of these kinds of solutions design, if a company just comes to you with a listing of technology and says, oh yeah, yeah, here's all the technology, but now it's just a price per bed, then I would say they haven't fully thought through all the design mechanisms of what is really needed to drive an outcome, to drive an improvement, to drive efficiency, right? Because it's not just about a different way to show up with technology and for you guys to pay for it, right? That's, that, that's a, that's a, there's another level of dimension of problems that need to be solved in a hospital. So when we talk about, you know, from our perspective within Philips, as I mentioned, we've got a couple offers that we've been working on. Enterprise monitoring as a service is certainly one of them. Uh, there's also enterprise diagnostic informatics as a service. There's health suite informatics as a service. We're working on a whole host of other things like consumables as a service and telemetry and 
whole host of other areas, right? And we keep evolving this portfolio. We we feel so strongly about this as the future. We've we've been uh, redesigning, redeveloping our platforms to ensure this structure and our technology and our innovation around it, but also to set our company up for success by creating a new business, right? And not just you know having this run out of some group. The key thing here is that as you grow or you change over time, we deliver the standard capabilities, but as different things come up, as you need new functionality, as we know that uh, you want to add a site or you want to add a unit or you're doing a new tower, the whole point is that, that we shouldn't have to go through a whole procurement model again to go and buy and figure all this out. It should really be about saying, well, we already have a contract in place. That's really not about add, buying new technology. It's really about saying, well, how many more beds are in that new tower or how many new beds are there? Or how many more patients do you think you're going to see in that new unit? And applying the fee structure to it, but us delivering the technology that you need with the integration to make sure that, that those units can go live. And it streamlines the whole procurement process pretty significantly because in the contract, we guarantee certain capabilities. Now, those capabilities, whether that gets replaced three times with a new monitor or a new server or whatever, or in the in the term of the contract, that's up to us to make sure, right? The goal is you stay standard, you stay current, and you stay upgraded, and you can keep evolving and growing and changing, and we can adapt to that, right? And it's not this kind of constant thing. And, th and that's fundamentally some of the things you see with any of these as-a-service models. It's meant to actually provide you a lot more flexibility. So this is a little bit about enterprise monitoring service. As I said, I'm not going to go into all kinds of details about it, but from a patient monitoring perspective, um, what we built and what we designed was around these four pillars, similar to what we talked about before. And that other slide was capabilities, you know, predictability, but ultimately delivering that through these four pillars of clinical deliverable entitlements, the technology entitlements, and the engagement model, right? Which also includes a layer of analytics as a part of this. And then either this pay per patient, we actually have two fee structures, a pay per patient or a pay per bed. So you're encompassing getting everything from the monitors, the servers, the entire infrastructure, the platform, the software, um, you know, the EMR integration, um, the clinical management, ongoing education, uh, ensuring adoption by the clinicians, uh, where we see the need for optimization projects like workflow improvement or deterioration automation or care standard efficiency or reduction in alarms, uh, whatever it is, uh, you know, telemetry utilization, for example, uh, or improvement or reduced days on telemetry. These are all things that can be part of the clinical and the technical management. Uh, and it's usually part, you know, part of an entitlement structure. Um, and then also the strategic multi-year planning. So what I would say, kind of what I was saying is when, when you see a shift as a service models, right, and especially in healthcare, it's a little bit different than some other industries. But based on what we know from customers and what they fundamentally said, we need to solve these other problems other than just how to get, like the technology piece, it's a critical piece, but it almost becomes table stakes, right? It's like, give me the technology that I need, where I need it, keep it updated, keep it secure, keep it proactively monitored, keep it secure, but I wanna drive outcomes through the clinical and the engagement model and the analytics, right? And I wanna pay for all of that, you know, in one simple predictable fee, right? So this is kind of our, our structure around, uh, you know, and if anyone wants to know more about it, we can follow up separately. Again, this wasn't to kind of, you know, sell you on anything, but just to give you a real concrete example of, of a true as a service model that is running at many customers now, there's proof points, uh, there's press releases, there's studies on improvements in hours saved and reduction in telemetry utilization through them consuming this model. The other key thing to look at is typically whenever assets or equipment is involved in any of these kinds of as a service models, um, you get into this conversation of whether it's a lease construction or not. So for us personally, we worked closely with, um, with Ernest & Young. Uh, to really look at how we could think very differently about our technology um, to make sure that this was not a lease construction, but from an accounting perspective could truly be seen as a, as a service construction from an accounting perspective, um, because there's downsides to uh, having even an OPEX lease run through a PL. So this is where we've spent a lot of time with uh, CFOs when we were doing our co-creation. It's 
many CFOs with some of the leasing guidelines that were changing in 2017 said to us, if this is a lease, I'm not interested. Uh, we got to figure out a way to get this to true service accounting treatment, right? That's what's the best for my P&L. So, so again, looking at how you make that shift, right? How, how we shift from a capital perspective, moving more towards OPEX, right? And a much more manageable, predictable approach to it. So lastly, before we go to kind of q and I think I've just got a few more slides here. I think what, what I want to kind of talk about is, is part of this, right? And, and I think this is where you guys will also see uh, a lot of importance because it also enables uh, this community in your functions to come to the table with credibility and data that you probably haven't had access for from before, especially in the patient monitoring world, right? So a lot of a lot of the you know complaints we get from I don't say complaints but you know insights and 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 sharing from our customers is great I've got all this technology I don't know how to get any data out of it to understand how is it being used where is it being used uh, where my peaks are where my right so part of designing and developing this model it's a service right as a service you should also be able to gain some insights. So driving that credibility is not just about delivering a new way of doing business and a new business model, right? In a, in a fundamentally, you have a CapEx way of doing business, right? Capital transactional episodic, or at the highest level, in effect, a reoccurring payment business model, right? Um, so we tie that to a shared purpose and risk, right? We also have uptime guarantees, for example, um, but it requires us as a company to not just change the payment model, but enable an end-to-end -end customer and Philips experience, which I personally seen a lot of this being driven through the dashboard. Like we have quarterly oversight meetings with our customers. We review the Intel, the data, you know, sometimes we have daily touch points uh, in different engagements with different stakeholders in our hospitals that we've got running uh, EMOS on, for example. We have the real-time data capture and it really allows us to identify some meaningful insights. And I'm going to be transparent, even within, this is also new for us, right? We have clinicians, we have engineers, we have data scientists in our company. It's not even necessarily data we've correlated with real clinical data in the past, right? So now we see this model running at six hospitals, 27 clinics. We're seeing the correlations of data, right? We're seeing the correlations to uh, where adherence and adoption is not happening. If we know in entitled CO2, in, in cardiac patients, and you know, as a measurement, entitled CO2 is supposed to be being used, and it's not, we can see that now. Well, why is it not being used, right? If that's, if that's a best practice from a clinical perspective, why is it not being used, right? Or where are departments and units that there's actually capability or capacity, but it's not visible to anyone right now? Right? Literally, it's like, is there a body in a bed? No, we can actually see that from the data. So these are things that change the relationship and the dynamic significantly. And one of the things we did around the oversight and reporting, which is the key part of the entitlements and the deliverable in the model, is making sure that now you start to aggregate that of operational and uh, clinical efficiency and best practice management across a region or a network of hospitals, right? or in a hospital, or even down to the department acuity level, right? And our typical reporting is in these areas at the bottom, like, so what's your volumes? What's your utilization? What are you using? What's your fees associated with that? Because if we're a price per bed or even a price per patient, in, in the case where it's a price per bed, you pay a fixed fee for that bed uh, for all those capabilities and all that technology, whether the patient is in it or not. But in a price per patient, it's a pure usage model. You're only paying if you use it. Right, so who's the risk is on us, right, to make sure that it's available. So when there is a patient there, it can be used. Um, we also manage the system performance and provide, you know, an SLA as well as an uptime report, you know, uh, on performance overall. Uh, what service activity proactively? I know, you know, in the U.S. and in Canada, there there are um, reports that have to be given on when were these monitors last serviced or when were certain things done. So providing those reports at a click of a button for you to also help. Um, acid inventory and use, that's how I was talking about, well, what's being used? Where is it being used? How long was it used for? Where was it not used? What's missing? Where did things go missing? I can't tell you the number of things that, you know, uh, transport monitors have end up in a washing machine, for example, right? And we can see where, where was it last in the unit? 
Um, then the ongoing education and adoption, right? And then defining specific KPIs with your organization that we want to drive as an improvement, like reduction in telemetry, reduction in alarms. Those are not a separate consulting project. It's a core part of the deliverables and what ends up being delivered as a part of it. And these are all really important things that when you're looking at any as a service model, I would ultimately, if I was a customer, I would absolutely be expecting a vendor to be having these things here because this heightens our ability to change and address those issues. So this is just an example of, you know, uh, the kind of dashboard showing this in a quarterly review where we can kind of look at different um, uh, ongoing interaction, anytime, anywhere access, you know, looking at by stakeholders, looking at it by hospital, looking at it by unit, et cetera, and where things are performing, trending up, trending down, not trending so well, et cetera. So this is just an example of typically when you deliver some kind of an as a service, this is also what I would expect, which we work closely with the biomed community on and the IT community and the clinical community, which is why we really kind of break it out in this three, let's call them swim lanes, right? There's this ongoing planning and performance. And this is actually an example from one of our customers where we literally plan in oversight committee meetings where data is reviewed, insights are gained, decisions are made, uh, where we do volume and adoption review, where things, you know, what's our progress on adoption by clinicians? Where are we not seeing adoption use of certain measurements? Where do we need to readdress that? Does that trigger a new education program uh, or a refresh education, for example? Um, for example, we had one hospital that implemented early warning scoring for deterioration management. No idea whether it was being used or not, right? So part of this model, we said, well, we're going to track it. Well, actually, six months into it, we all agreed that it was a new workflow. We all agreed it was the right practice, but actually 20% of the cases where patients should have had early warning scoring done or should have had um, you know, that, that uh, score put in place, it was missing in the system, right? Wasn't, was never done. So just visibility, and, it, and it's not to now go and say to the clinicians, why didn't you do that? There's probably a reason, and we have, we've uncovered many reasons of why certain things are not being adopted. But I think the key thing is, is that when you just buy technology, you don't have any visibility or awareness of that, right? And that's part of this kind of a model and coming, bringing it together and that data collection and that analysis, right? Then on the clinical perspective, there's but month by month, a whole plan, as well as on the technology of, you know, when quarterly window patching is going to be done. And these are all things that we would agree with yourselves and your IT community, like, okay, does that make sense to do that in February? Well, actually our EMR is also doing a software upgrade. That's probably not the best month to do that. And maybe we should push that out a month, right? Or what's in that next patch? Is it worthwhile for us? Do we have to do it? Because it's gonna require us to take a few units down or what have you. These are all the things that when we bring it all together in this over cycle planning and performance, we can manage through it. And lastly, uh, I'll give you a little bit of, uh, you know, part of achieving the quadruple aim. Um, Jackson is, was one of our first hospitals in 2018. Uh, they started off with one hospital, 1,500 bed facility. Now they've expanded another four hospitals and 27 clinics onto the model. Um, so extensively rich, right? But we focused on looking at measurable improvements in actionable patient alarms and alarm noise, right? So this is one thing they said, we want to tackle this on the model. We need to do it alarm management. We need to do better alarm management. We need to look at data continuity, integration, document, and data, right? But also how do we reduce non-value added uh, hours by clinicians um, as a part of that integration and data continuity issue, right? Where are we adding time to clinicians, time not with patients, right? That they are literally spending time doing manual clinical documentation when it actually could be automated, right? Um, so reducing that non-value added work and seamless integration, um, looking at improvement and efficiency and throughput, right? And also looking at how do we reduce that technology obsolescence, right? And, and getting away from any issue with aged or non-standard technology across an IDN or a, a region. Um, but ultimately bringing that together and putting numbers to the page to say, how is this actually driving outcomes? And so again, there's, there's actually a couple of case studies that we just did. Um, one is uh, managing improvements in telemetry workflow and the results from that and the reduction of days on tele. Uh, from the case with Jackson, we actually uncovered through the data that 
they were keeping patients on telemetry two days longer than they really needed to. And uh, in, in most cases, it was happening over the weekend, right? So what we, in peeling back the onion, we uncovered, yeah, someone, a clinician didn't take the patient off telemetry, ended up staying on the weekend, but that actually, why is that a problem? Well, Jackson runs at a 98% occupancy. That Those are beds that could have been freed up, right? Or they could have gotten the patient out of the hospital quicker. So these kinds of insights um, seem like maybe an operational efficiency, but definitely bring a lot of drive. We also uh, just did a, Jackson just did a recent article with the consuming the EMOS model through the pandemic and the amount of flexibility and changing that needed to happen with, with very minimal uh, impact to them, right? Um, in terms of uh, making sure that we, we called it a pandemic stress test, so to speak. Um, but these are just some examples of impact around hours saved by clinicians on patient transport and charting. So hours that were just non-value at a time that they were 13,000 hours not spending with the patient. Um, so, you know, hours saved and optimized transport, for example, looking at, and part of a big part of this is making sure we baseline this, right? So what are the starting uh, time and motion studies so that we know after we go live and after they're consuming the model what the two is, and then these become the trends, right? But also driving staff satisfaction is important, especially in these days related to retention of staff and management of staff. All right, so that's pretty much all I have. I think we can go to Q&A uh, pretty close to the 1245 mark. Yeah, I think that was pretty close. Thank you so much, Jamie. That was fantastic. Um, so uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please do type it in the, the Q&A chat. Um, and over to you guys, Carl, uh, David, and Jamie. I think there's a couple of questions there already. Uh, yeah, some good questions in the chat already. So um, maybe I'll just start to, with this one, talking about AI. When we envision AI, how much does as a service benefit uh, Philips AI development? And how do you see that? trust relationship between vendor and customer developing? How much will who owns the data play in data acquisition? Yep, I think mean, that's an excellent question. So um, what I would say is, first of all, hospital always owns the data, right? It's your patient. Uh, I mean, you, you could actually say the patient owns the data because it's their data. But, but ultimately, um, we've also set up infrastructure in these models uh, for example, Jackson, you know, will, will not, doesn't want anything in the cloud. So everything has to be on-prem. Um, and those are all different options that we can look at with our customers in terms of the architecture and how we set that up to make sure that we adhere to their security protocols. Um, what, we, what we do have in the contract and in the agreement, coming back to your point about AI, is that I think as a part of a true partnership like this, right, where we agree that certain data is valuable for the development of innovation, which could actually help with driving predictability. Um, now, I spent a lot of time in my years with clinicians, and I always try to stay away from the, the term clinic, clinic, clinical decision support, um, because clinicians will say, no, no, let's be clear, I make the decision, you can provide me all the information, and you can make a recommendation, but, uh, I'm ultimately the one who's going to make the, the decision that's best for the patient, which is, is absolutely valuable and it's absolutely true. So I think also as Philips, we're, we're careful around our development of AI in the sense that we definitely want to things, make things more automated. We definitely want to bring things together. We know the data tells us that it can be done, um, but how we serve that up and how we manage it and, how, uh, and what decisions uh, clinicians are willing to accept and take off of that recommendation, I think is is really part of the partnership to, to weed out and to figure out how it works. So for example, like at Jackson and at Truman, in our contract, we have certain uh, agreements on you know, what, what data is that we see, right? We have access to everything is de-anonymized, so we don't actually see patients' names or IDs or anything like that. But the importance of it in relative to other, uh, and it's really, you know, from a data scientist perspective, it's making that correlation. And then you actually get a really good use case to start driving some AI innovation as well. So that's where we work together on that. And, um, you know, with some larger organizations we're working with, uh, they also want to really get into that with us. Some of them have data scientists themselves where we partner up with, and we're working on that together to see where, where we can bring added value and innovation. All right, thanks, Jamie. Um, 
there was one question off the top about regulatory approvals. Um, so I can, if you'd like, I can take a stab at that and you can provide any further perspective since this is Canada specific. Yep, um, go so, ahead. So, so what progress has been made in regulatory approval by Health Canada for cloud-based software as a medical device, as in SAAS? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, essentially, I'm not a regulatory expert, I'm a marketing person, but uh, essentially all software, whether it's, you know, resident in a hard drive or cloud-based is all medical software is approved by Health Canada. Um, the one additional thing that I know we've had to uh, look into when we have uh, launched cloud-based systems in Canada, not this EMAS specifically, but other cloud-based systems, is that there is a desire from a privacy standpoint to make sure that the data resided within Canada. And we did accomplish that by using Amazon Web Services um, as a host uh, to have um, hardware in within Canada so that everything stays within the country. That's it's exactly spot on, uh, Carl. With with AWS, uh, from a business and a and a R and D development perspective, we have the same thing in Germany. We have the same thing in many countries. Like Germany is even stricter in terms of, for example, you know, you can't even have someone access the data from outside the country, right? So I literally had to have to hire someone to sit in Germany to even access dashboard data or something like that, right? So there's different rules in in each of the different countries, but but primarily to your point, there there's no question it, it doesn't leave the country, and there's ways to architect that with cloud in country or even AWS even does a cloud on prem uh, that we can we can look at how we leverage. All right, thank you. Um, next question. So, um, James, I know you were looking this one up. The Patch Act being introduced in the USA puts the onus back on medical device manufacturers to ensure obsolescence for the life of the product. How is this influencing Philips' decision to introduce as a service products? Yeah, I'll, I'll give that one a shot. I actually had to go look that up, um, to be honest with you. It, to, to be clear, it's currently just a proposal that has appears not to have moved, so it's not a law yet or anything. But what it does appear to cover is maintaining, you know, cybersecurity of medical devices and software, um, which, you know, I believe is is very much a focus of what we do as part of our routine software updates and maintenance, product development, and so forth. Um, and I believe in, in the cases where we are taking responsibility for networks and so forth, um, that's certainly part of our of our focus is to make sure that the security is is kept up to date. So um, that that's I guess that's that's all we can say about that one. Um, and uh, I guess when that becomes you know when that actually becomes a law then there may be some other implications. But at this point, like I said, it's been introduced, hasn't really moved anywhere from what we can tell. Right, and and it's, I mean, traditionally, at least in the, you know, the as a service model, um, traditionally, at least related to antivirus and certain security parameters, I mean, that's just part of the entitlements, right? That's part of what you get, and it's our responsibility with coordination with yourself and, and with IT. Uh, to make sure that those things happen, planned and timing, that's where that timeline comes in, so that we identify when those things need to happen. Uh, we're, the, we're the catalyst in you know, identifying, saying, you know, this and this needs to happen, let's get it scheduled, let's make it happen. But just to clarify, though, um, uh, you know, is the question specifically related to you know, sort of cyber threats, or is it more to software obsolescence and onward compatibility and so forth? I don't know if that uh, asker can clarify that for us, um, if that was that. Because again, the Patch Act really pertains to cyber, but I was, you know, wondering if there's more to it in terms of obsolescence, because to Jamie's point, as part of the entitlements, we take on technology planning um, and certainly maintaining currency uh, and compatibility is, is part of what we commit to uh, when we provide this service to customers under this model. Okay, maybe we'll take a, another question while we're waiting for any clarification uh, from the asker on that one. Uh, so a couple of questions have come in around cost, understandably. Um, so the first one is around um, the difference between um, Capital purchase versus as, as a service, and you know, no one's been able to really demonstrate that it costs less than the purchase approach. 
Um, and then the second question around cost is um, the per patient model of financing is very interesting. If we get better at moving patients out of beds, Phillips gets higher incremental costs. It seems to work against the triple aim of lower costs. In fact, this at first glance looks much higher, looks, looks like a much higher total cost of ownership, trade off being the management of risk, but not the ownership of it. Um, I, so, so let me break down both of those, right? So um, the first thing is um, when you look at from a price point perspective, um, I, I've worked on many business cases with customers, right? So the, the first issue is that you need to look at your total cost of owning or buying, owning, running, right? And that includes, you know, people, resources. We have, we have a spreadsheet that has over 100 line items of typical costs that are incurred by a hospital by running patient monitoring, for example, right? So when you look at the shift to this model, because if you just look at the buying of the technology, right, just buying the capital purchase of the technology at a one point or one time, that's not the full picture. Then it's an apples to oranges comparison. If you're going to look at the shift of this model over a seven year period and paying a price per bed or a fee per patient, right, and a Q times P with an annual number, roughly, right, then you have to compare that price to what it, you know, even if you just look at the last eight years, right, last eight years and what it actually costs you. Now, the, the problem that many hospitals have is that they don't actually know where all their running costs are. When you, when typically when I sit down with the biomedical teams as well as finance and we go through that list, they typically go, yeah, we're spending money. I'm not sure whose budget it's in though. So the transparency of what historically has actually been spent on all these different things is not necessarily uh, yet the ready, let's put it that way. But I can I can tell you that when we've done that analysis, there's not, there, there's not more cost. It doesn't cost more to move this model, right? And you get updated, val you get value to now actually drive an outcome or an improvement or an efficiency and maybe a cost reduction someplace else that was never been able to achieved or reached when you just bought technology, right? So. That analysis is typically part of, of a business model shift. Um, we've done it many times. We've done it with many finance teams as well as uh, IT and, and biomed teams. Um, and the case always proves to be advantageous. Um, now, the other part of what you were saying is the shift to patients. So I'm not quite sure I understand the, but I'm gonna kind of try to take a stab at it. I, I think there's some correlations being made to it, right? So it doesn't increase the cost. Because in effect, especially in Canada, right, you have running costs to care for those patients in the hospital, right? So there's cost of staff, there's there's a cost of you know whole host of different things to basically have a patient in the hospital and deliver care to them, right? Hospital gets funded, right, for for that cost. I mean, even in Canada, even from you know th there's still quote reimbursement on that patient, right, based on their diagnosis code. Um, now, it may be the government doing the reimbursement, right, or private insurers or whatever, but it's there's still a reimbursement, right, on that patient. So when you look at the cost of having that patient in the hospital, right, and so from, from our perspective, it's not about, it's about making sure that you have the right technology, education, all of that, where and when you need it to care for that patient. Now, if you're able to improve throughput, right, the, the only, there's, there's, Regardless of whether there's more cost on us or not, that's why it's a shared risk and a shared, that's the risk we're taking, right? We have to deliver the capability and the capacity. Now, if that requires us adding two more beds or if that requires us adding certain things and there's not more patient volume, well, then it, it is what it is, right? Then you don't pay more per patient for it. But now on the flip side of it, if we are able to help you improve Though that throughput of those patients, there is reimbursement for those patients. So that's actually more patients that you can see and get through and we get paid to it. So it's a direct correlation. And, and actually one CFO said to me, I, I think it was actually when we were in Canada too. He's like, well, the thing is, whether we realize it or not, hospitals and healthcare are actually a fee for service already. We already run as an as a service model, right? So 
we deliver care and after the fact we get paid for it or we get some kind of a reimbursement right for that patient based on a certain set amount so it is already a fee for for care the CFO's perspective is you're just matching now the business model to my P&L and my cash flow, which isn't necessarily about profit. It's about matching it to the cash flow. I don't know if that fully answered the question, but that's 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 part of what you kind of work through when you work through the business case. Okay, thanks, Jamie. Um, another one, finance related. Uh, often the Canadian hospitals equipment is funded with a capital model. It often requires rethinking from hospital executive team and even a government funding source to see service as a funding model. The yep. US has a different model in Canada in terms of billing model. For Canada or other countries with publicly funded hospital, how has Philips helped hospital slash government to rethink this funding model? Yeah, so I mean, I think that's a great question, right? And, and we, as I said, I was just in Australia who has a very similar healthcare system to Canada as well. Um, so part of it is also, I, I can tell you that with some of the, in the countries, even some of the large tenders um, that are coming out from regions, right, which are also uh, connected from a government perspective, they are asking the question around these alternative business models, right? How do we actually address the problems and solve for this in a much more digestible, manageable way? Because big, and and, and let's quite honestly, with inflation and everything else. I mean, this doesn't, you know, this doesn't have anything to do with the US and how the reimbursement model, I mean, it, it's in general, it's the access to capital, right, across the world. So, and, and how is that funded? And where is that coming from? Whether it's coming from taxes or whether it's coming from anything. I mean, what I think even governments will recommend even in, in nationalized health systems is uh, we're, not, we're not giving huge cash infusion, infusions, right? to to be able to do some of this stuff like so there's there's a stability that and we certainly see it more and more even in tender requests and with our relationships with different governing bodies we're saying phillips what what are you doing to address some of these capital constraints of buying technology when we know we're not actually we're, we're not driving any cost or efficiency of care so I think this is exactly where this kind of a model comes into play to get people starting to think differently. Okay. Um, we have next here. So I think we I think we all agree we'd like better usage and adoption dashboards and reports from our patient monitoring systems. Why does this need to be provided under an as a service model and not available with a traditional acquisition and contract model? Um, because part of it is that we we fundamentally see um, as a part of uh, the ownership as well as the responsibility, there's there's data that we can provide to you, but without the right access ourselves or ability to ensure that it's upgraded, then we can provide you a dashboard. That doesn't actually mean that the insights, we can drive any improvements to it, right? So it, the dashboard's a tool to drive insights and identification of where there's problems and there's issues. But that doesn't mean that it's gonna get solved, which is why the integral part to the model, which is the data is an enabler to then have something built into the model to actually drive. And, 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 I, and also we, we've had customers say, well, okay, fine. You know, yes, we, we do way too many alarms or we have way too many alarms, okay. So they see that in the data. They may put some kind of a clinical improvement project in place to drive the reduction of alarms. I can guarantee you that within six to eight months, it will go back again. Because nine times of what we're dealing with and what we uncover in this is it comes down to daily behaviors of people. It comes down to changing of staff, to the ongoing changes and reoccurring changes that happen in a dynamic environment. And even if you can make an improvement, the the chance of it uh, sinking back in, um, and it's that ongoing engagement with us as a partner that showing that data, understanding that data, what does it mean making joint decisions because it could impact the change in the technology, for example. We may change configurations to make an improvement. We may do certain things. 
that also requires us and our insight at the table um, to, to make the identified change or improvement based on the data. So we've just seen that when you just drop off, I mean, just providing a dashboard is just, it's no different than just providing a, another product and say, yeah, go use it. Doesn't mean you're gonna actually get the improvement or the outcome or the adoption. It's still episodic in nature. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have maybe time for one more. There's one more in the chat that I can pull up. Um, do these business models include the cost of accessories and supplies like cables, leads, electrodes, transducers, cuffs, probes, et cetera? They absolutely can. Uh, so we've built that, we can build that into the model. It's an option. Uh, what we found in a lot of countries is that many of the uh, the hospitals have, you know, large buying contracts for consumables and, uh, you know, things like that. So we we don't want to disrupt that. Um, but for example, with Jackson, when we when we signed the contract, uh, and with Truman, they had existing uh, companies in place that they were buying uh, their all their consumables through. Um, but they've said as soon as that contract is up, they would like to just add it and roll it into the model. So that's part of what uh, we're working through is, is part of the an optional add-on. And, and networking can also be uh, an optional add-on as well. Okay. Um, we can take one more, Carl. Sure. There was one more here that I, I lost somewhere, but it had to do with um, how is EMAS different from a typical MES type of uh, agreement structure? Um, so it, it depends what's in MES, right? So you're you're kind of maybe going along the same lines of, you know, it's it's managed equipment services, right? But typically, depending on what's in the MES, what technology is in the MES, you might fall into the lens of it being, um, for example, a lease. Um, and it also depends on how much of it. So we we still have an MES uh, organization. We still offer MES to our customers when it's much broader across multiple modalities, let's say. For patient monitoring, at least, um, you know, we this is where we've really created the enterprise monitoring as a service offering in this space. Um, but it has a lot of it has a lot of similarities in terms of entitlements and the ongoing delivery of entitlements to manage that service, um, but also with a lot of clinical uh, and analytics as a part of driving outcomes. Typically with MES, there's not necessarily the the guarantee or part of it of driving driving the outcomes or the improvements. It's still about managing technology versus the other dimensions of the clinical and the operational efficiency. Great, thanks. I think that was it for the questions, Adil. Great, thank you so much. Um, Jamie and, and uh, Carl and team, um, if folks do wanna reach out or if they have further questions, um, what would be the best way to contact you guys? I think, Carl, do you want to take the lead on that? Yeah, I would say, um, David, if you're willing, since you're the expert here in Canada on this, um, that people could come to you, if that's all right. Yeah. I don't know if you could share yeah. your contact details in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. Yep. We were we work closely, all of us together. So if if David, you take the lead, then, then uh, we can definitely uh, connect on anything that comes out and follow up. And, awesome. and by the way, if you guys have any ideas, I know there's a lot of questions, but if you also have ideas and you feel, you know, passionate also that this could truly help driving, driving some of the objectives and delivery of care within Canada, but you see a barrier around uh, thought leadership and educating even, you know, government levels and things like that, like we would love your ideas to, you know, to, to create more visibility to this. Um, because especially with kind of what we see happening in the world and the economy, we see more and more customers globally uh, kind of really thinking about how to shift to this. So we'd, we'd love your thoughts even, you know, from a, from a Canada specific perspective. Great. Thank you so much, Jamie. This was very insightful, very interesting. Uh, and I think really sort of a shift change, I think from 
from the hospital biomedical lens for sure in, in how we sort of manage our medical equipment. So I think there'll be a lot of good discussion and uh, and ha happy to engage you guys further in, in this. Um, Great. So for everybody uh, at this time, we will conclude. Um, thank you so much for joining. Um, what we'll uh, and looking forward to you guys joining in our next uh, webinar that's going to happen October 25th uh, related to right to repair. So please join us at that time as well. Um, and that signing off then. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.